The air crackled, static buzzed from the vintage microphone. Bones, the new podcaster, storyteller of satire and fiction, this new urban folk tale of truth or fairy dust. Another satire story by your brother Bones with my easy smile, usually ever present, faltered under the weight of the story I'm about to tell. With my podcast studio dimly lit and filled with the ghosts of countless tales, um, I'm usually used to the bright lights of Phoenix, the comforting presence of a napalm in the morning. This story, however, felt different, raw, exposed. It happened a few years back. I was driving home from a Circle K late, way past midnight, when all the crackheads are playing. The, the, the city outside of Payson, nor, normally a, symp a, a, a symphony of sound, was eerily quiet. Even the ever-present of traffic had faded to a distant whisper. I remembered the feeling of unease creeping in, the way my gut had twisted with a premonition I couldn't quite place. Uh, with me not being a seasoned interviewer uh, with, a, with a penchant for the paranormal, I leaned forward, my eyes reflecting the... The, uh, the faint glow of the studio lights seemed to bore into me. There was no judgment, only a quiet fascination, a hunger for the truth that lay buried beneath the surface of my carefully constructed composure. I started feeling the weight of the moment, took a deep breath and continued, my voice barely a whisper. The streets were deserted, shadows stretching like long fingers across the asphalt. I gazed distant, lost in a memory of past relationships. The image of that night imprinted on my mind flashed before my eyes the way the, 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 uh, the street lights had flickered, casting an unsettling strobe effect on the empty sidewalks. The, the way that this, the silence had amplified every creak and groan of my car, I could almost feel the chill that had settled over me despite the summer heat. I was approaching a particularly dark stretch of road when I saw her, a young woman standing on the sidewalk, her thumb extended in the universal gesture of a hitchhiker. Uh, her face was obscured by the shadows of a nearby tree, but something about her demeanor, the way she stood, small and vulnerable, tugged at my heart. Reminded me of this girl I was dated named Jenny from from the block and she was special to me. I hesitated, years of ingrained caution warring with the sudden surge of empathy. I wasn't in the habit of picking up strangers, especially not at this time of night, and especially reminding of my ex and her misunderstanding of me when I was in troubled times from a previous relationship. But, uh, but something about the, the woman's desolate figure, the way she seemed to shrink under the, the harsh glare of my headlights like sparked a protective instinct within me. I, I told myself it was, it was the late hour, the unsettling emptiness of the streets that clouded my, my judgment. Looking back, I couldn't shake the feeling that something else had guided my hand toward the door lock. The woman practically fell into the car, her breath catching in a gasp of relief. She mumbled a thank you, her voice barely audible above the my truck engine. As she turned towards me, the, the streetlights flickered, momentarily illuminating her face. My breath hitched. Your... My voice was a mixture of disbelief and concern. It's, I couldn't believe it. What was she doing hitchhiking at this hour? Her smile, though strained, was unmistakable. Don't worry, she said, just drive. Her words were clipped, her, her eyes darting ner nervously towards the rearview mirror. I'm like, bitch, what you got me into? There was a tremor in her voice, a hint of barely contained panic that sent a shiver down Glenn's spine. I decided to, to trust my gut, something was wrong, or this bitch is on drugs or something worse, but I could be wrong. Hell, I am a Libra for crying out loud. I steered the car back onto the road, my mind racing. I snuck glances at this bitch-ass passenger, trying to reconcile the image of the A-Lady just killed previous in this area. I knew from reading the tabloids about this killer in the area that was eating bitches by rubbing hot body lotion on the ass up face down. She had shrunk back into the seat, her face hidden in the shadows. The silence in the car was deafening, broken only by her stank-ass breath. Where are you headed, I asked, trying to sound casual. I needed information, anything to make sense of the situation. The woman hesitated, her gaze flickering to Bone's face before returning to the window. Just a few blocks from here, 
she mumbled, her voice barely a whisper. I then noticed her hands were trembling, her fingers tightly clenched in her lap. I decided to take her to the nearest police station. It was the most logical course of action, the safest option for both me and this crazy bitch. I explained my plan, hoping to elicit some kind of explanation, a reason for her bizarre behavior. But she didn't seem to hear me. Her eyes were wide, fixated on something behind us. Don't, she hissed, her voice urgent, laced with panic. Don't slow down, just keep driving. It, I was about to argue to demand an explanation or simply punch this bitch in the face when I felt it too, a presence. Something dark and heavy settled in the air around them. I glanced at the rearview mirror, expecting to, to see headlights, but the road behind us was empty. Yet the fly saw, the, uh, the feeling persisted, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck, a coldness that seeped into the car despite the closed windows. I thought the PCP I just to smoke as a teenager was kicking. Bone's phone buzzed on the dashboard, the screen flashing with one of his dumbass baby mamas calling. He hesitated, his hand hovering over the device. You can almost hear him whisper to himself, that's the bitch that married my homeboy, JJ Jesus. The woman beside him remained silent, her gaze fixed on the road ahead, but her grip on his arm tightened, her nails digging into his skin. Don't answer it. She breathed, her voice barely audible. Ma, I'm ignoring this bitch with a growing sense of unease gripping me. I needed answers and this call felt like a lifeline. I pressed the speaker button, my heart pounding in my chest. Hello, he answered, his voice strained. The silence on the other end was deafening. Bones could hear his own pulse throbbing in his ears. I think Bones was about to snap and make some smoke in the city. Just as he was about to hang up, a voice, distorted and raspy, filled the car. Turn around, the voice commanded, each word laced with a chilling calmness that belied the menace in its tone. Take Becky bitch back to where you found her. My blood ran cold. I glanced at the woman beside me. Well, you guys should know by now, Beach. Her face was pale, her eyes wide with a terror that mirrored his own. He had stumbled into something dark, something dangerous. Bone's initial instinct was to dismiss it as a prank, a cruel joke. But please believe this motherfucker don't games with nobody. His wallet had BMF on it, meaning bad motherfucker, period. But the tone of the voice, the chilling calmness, and the woman's petrified silence told Bones otherwise. This was real. I had to make a decision. Obey the voice in my motherfucking head and risk leading us into a trap or defy it and face the unknown consequences. The weight of the situation pressed down on Bones, each breath suddenly heavy in his chest. I tightened my grip on the steering wheel, my knuckles turning purple, not white. Um, I could feel the woman's terrified gaze on me, her silence speaking volumes. My mind raced, searching for a way out, a solution that didn't involve putting myself and this terrified, frantic woman in further danger. Who is this? Bones demanded, his voice shaking slightly despite his attempt at bravado. What do you want? Uh, the only response was a chilling chuckle that echoed through the car, sending shivers down my spine. Meanwhile, big dummy over here beside me, whimpering, her grip on my arm tightening. I'm like, dummy, you know, I don't know you right. Move over, cuz, are you delusional? I could feel her fear palpable and contagious. He had to act fast. Bone's heart pounded against his ribs, a frantic rhythm against the backdrop of the city's eerie silence. Adrenaline surged through his veins, sharpening his senses, making him hyper aware of every shadow, every flicker of, in the motherfucking night. The voice on the phone, laced with an unspoken threat, hung heavy in the air, a constant reminder of the danger they were in. He had to get them out of this, but how? Uh, I glanced at Dummy the passenger, her face still hidden in the shadows. I couldn't see her expression, but I could, it, I could sense her terror, the way her body trembled with each rasping breath, you know, like a crackhead would do. I had to be strong for me and Dummy. I couldn't let this fear paralyze me. Not the old retired crib, not today, because today I got time, cuz. I had to think to strategize, you know, make it happen, cuz, or brother too old to be talking about gangs, but it was on and cracking. I had to find a way to outmaneuver, to outsmart whoever was behind this. An idea sparked in my mind, a desperate gamble, but one I was willing to take. 
I knew these streets like the back of my hand. Years of navigating the city's labyrinthine roads etched into my memory. Oh, and another ex-Elizabeth I used to date lived up here. Um, there was uh, a shortcut, a network of back alleys and uh, service roads that could lead us away from the main thoroughfares, away from whoever was following us. Uh, I made a sharp turn, then my, then my damn tires started screeching in protest as I veered off the main road and into a dimly lit side street. The sudden movement threw Dummy a gasp of fresh air. Dummy hand flew to her mouth to stifle a dumbass scream. What are you doing? She whispered, her voice hoarse with fear. I'm getting us out of here, I said, um, my voice firm trying to project a confidence I didn't quite feel. Just trust the process of bones. The car careened down the end of the narrow street, the headlights bouncing off the graffiti um, covered walls. The air grew thick with the stench of stale garbage and exhaust fumes. This part of the city, usually teeming with life, felt deserted, the silence amplifying the roar of the engine. Bones gripped the steering wheel, his knuckles purple, Bones' eyes scanning every shadow, every darkened doorway. I could feel the dummy, the passenger, gaze on me with a mixture of fear and hope. Bones had navigated the maze of back alleys with a familiarity that surprised even him. Turns Bones hadn't made in years came back to him instinctively. It was as if some primal part of Bones' brain had taken over, guiding him through the darkness. I think he found a blue rag because Bones had changed to something not even I have seen. The phone on the dashboard remained silent, but the chilling voice echoed in Bones' mind, a constant reminder of the danger that lurked behind them. But this guy grew up in dark alleys. I stole glances at the rearview mirror whenever possible. The street behind me remained, remained empty, but the, but the feeling of being followed persisted, a weight on my chest that refused to dissipate. I couldn't shake the feeling that they were being herded, led down a path, chosen for us, I mean me. I had to believe that my knowledge of the city, my desperate gamble would be enough to outsmart our pursuer. I emerged from the labyrinth of alleys onto a deserted boulevard, the city lights painting the sky in a hazy glow. The road stretched before me, seemingly endless, deserted. The silence was deafening, broken only by the hum of the engine and the frantic beating of his heart. I had to get her to safety, to somewhere we couldn't be followed. But where? Let me think, son. There's a diner, she said, pointing towards a flickering neon sign in the distance. A few blocks that way. It's open all night. So I... I followed her gaze, the diner, a, uh, a beacon of warmth and light in the desolate landscape, offered a glimmer of hope. It was a long shot, but it was the only option we had. Bones pressed down on the gas pedal, the engine roaring in response. The car surged forward, eating up the asphalt, carrying them towards the promise of safety. He could see the diner growing larger in the windshield, the neon sign casting long dancing shadows across the deserted street. Bones risked another glance at the rearview mirror. Still nothing. Had they finally lost them? As we as we approached the diner, I noticed a you I noticed a lone figure sitting at a booth by the window. The figure looked up, their face hidden in the shadows of a fedora. My heart sank. We were expected. I considered my options. I could keep driving. Uh, try to outrun whoever was after us, but the fear in my passenger's eyes told me she was corny ass fuck and we were out of time. I had to face this head on. Bones pulled up to the diner, the engine sputtering to a stop. The silence that descended was deafening, broken only by the distant hum of traffic from a far off highway. Bones turned to the woman beside him, his eyes meeting hers. Stay here, he said, his voice firm despite the tremor in his chest. Lock the doors and don't get out, no matter what you hear. I knew it was a futile request, a desperate attempt to shield her from the danger I was walking into, but I had to try. I ain't from Africa, I'm from Crenshaw Mafia, fool like the movie. The bell above the diner door chimed as Bones pushed inside, the scent of coffee and greasy food washing over him. Man, this diner was deserted, except for the lone figure at the counter. They're back to me. 
I moved towards the figure, each step heavy with trepidation. I could feel his pulse throbbing in his ears, a frantic rhythm against the backdrop of the diner's eerie silence. As I approached this fool, the figure turned, and I found myself staring into a pair of cold, calculating eyes. Uh, the man was, was older than I expected, his face etched with lines that spoke of a life lived on the edge. Uh, he wore an expensive suit that seemed at odds with the diner's humble surroundings. Um, he looked at me, a thin smile playing on his lips. Mr. Bones, he said, his voice smooth, cultured. I believe you have something that belongs to me. Something in the man's demeanor, a quiet confidence that radiated from his every move, told Bones that escape was not an option. I don't know what you're talking about. I said my voice firm despite the tremor that ran through me. Kick rocks is what I said. I had to maintain the upper hand, however slight. Bones' mind raced. Bones had never seen this man before in his life. Who was he? And what could he possibly want? Bones glanced at the door, calculating the distance. Could Bones make it before the man reacted? Bones dismissed the thought as quickly as it arose. Uh, this fool chuckled, a low, rumbling sound that seemed to vibrate through the diner. Oh, but you do, Mr. Bones, he said, his smile widening. You see, she has a habit of borrowing things that don't belong to her. Things that are quite valuable, I assure you. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a photograph, sliding it across the counter towards me. Bones stared at the photograph, Bones' blood turning to ice. It was a picture of the woman from his car, her face pale, her eyes wide with terror. But it was the inscription scrawled across the back that sent a chill down his spine. Help me, it read, the letters shaky, desperate. He looked up at the man, his mind reeling. Who was this dummy, and what had I gotten myself into? Where is she, I demanded, my voice hoarse with a sudden surge of protectiveness. I had to get her out of this, whatever it took. The man's smile widened, revealing a set of teeth that seemed too sharp, too predatory. That, Mr. Powell, is not your concern, he said, his voice still calm, but with an underlying current of menace that sent shivers down my spine. Now I believe you have something for me, the man continued, his gaze fixed on Bone's right hand. Bones instinctively clenched his fist, his mind racing. I had nothing on me except my phone and wallet. What could this fool of a man possibly want? As if, if reading my thoughts, the man chuckled again, a low guttural sound that seemed to echo through the diner. The keys, Mr. Bones, he said, his voice silky smooth, like another dummy waiting to get punched in the mouth. The keys to your car. Bones hesitated. He couldn't hand her over. Bones had promised her safety, however foolishly. Bones looked at the man, his mind racing, desperately searching for another way out. Bones could feel beads of sweat forming on his forehead, his heart pounding against his ribs. Bones had to stall for time, to find a way to contact the homies, to get help. Now, Mr. Bones, the man said, his voice laced with an impatience that brooked no argument. He stood up, his hand disappearing inside his jacket. Bones' eyes widened in anger. I had to act and act fast. I lunged towards the bitch-ass dude over the counter, adrenaline surging through my veins, but the man was faster. He grabbed Bones by the arm, his grip like a vice, and shoved Bones back against the counter. Don't test me, boy, the man hissed, his voice low and dangerous. He pressed something cold and hard against Bones' side, a gun. Uh, I tossed my strap onto the counter. I gazed him right in the eyes, fixed on this buster's face, trying to gauge my next move. An old trick I learned by having two guns now. The man picked up the keys, his eyes gleaming with triumph. He took a step back, his gun still trained on me. You've been most helpful, Mr. Bones, he said, his voice laced with a sardonic amusement. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an appointment to keep. Narrator. Bones' breath hitched. I was trapped, outmatched, and out of options. I had to comply, especially not even knowing dummy in the car. With trembling hands, Bones reached into his pocket and pulled out his car keys. And with that, he turned and walked out of the diner, disappearing into the night. Bones stood there for a moment, his body trembling with adrenaline and anger. I had to get to my car, had to make sure Dummy was safe. I stumbled out of the diner as if I didn't have my hand on my Ruger 5.7 in my other hand. I ran towards my car, my heart pounding in my chest. But as I approached, my, my blood ran cold. The car was empty. The woman was gone. I searched frantically, my heart sinking with each passing moment. I was too late. Back in the podcast studio, silence hung heavy in the air. Bones, his face pale, his eyes haunted by the memory of that night, finished his story.
The host, usually quick with a joke or a comforting word, sat back in his chair, his face uncharacteristically serious. And you never saw her again? The host asked, his voice barely a whisper. Bones shook his head, the movement slow and heavy. No, I said, my voice a hollow echo of its usual vibrancy. The police never found any trace of her. No missing person report, no leads, nothing. It was like she vanished into thin air. Do you think it was real? The host asked, his gaze fixed on me. Bones met his gaze, his eyes reflecting the weight of the question. Bone had asked himself that same question countless times over the years. Was it a real encounter, a brush with the sinister underbelly of the city?